Unfortunately, Lily does not have a chance of winning Percy Bryce back. At the reception, she learns that he and Evie Van Osper are engaged. Lily returns to the home of her aunt, Mrs. Peniston, who provides for her, though not as generously as Lily would like. After several days of languishing at Mrs. Peniston's, Lily is thrilled to receive an unexpected visitor. A ring at the doorbell, sounding emphatically through the empty house, roused Lily suddenly to the extent of her boredom. It was as though all the weariness of the past months had culminated in the vacuity of that interminable evening. If only the ring meant a summons from the outer world. A token, a token that she was still remembered and wanted. A parlor maid presented herself with the announcement that there was a person outside asking to see Miss Bart. It's Mrs. Haffin, Miss. She won't say what she wants. Lily, to whom the name conveyed nothing, opened the door upon a woman in a battered bonnet who stood firmly planted under the hall light. The glare of the unshaded gas shone on her pockmarked face and the reddish baldness visible through thin strands of straw-colored hair. Lily looked at the charwoman in surprise. Do you wish to see me, she asked. I should like to say a word to you, miss. The tone revealed nothing of the speaker's errand. Nevertheless, some precautionary instinct warned Lily to withdraw beyond earshot of the hovering parlor maid. She signed to Mrs. Haffin to follow her into the drawing room and closed the door when they had entered. What is it that you wish, she inquired. The charwoman stood with her arms folded in her shawl. Unwinding the ladder, she produced a small parcel wrapped in dirty newspaper. I have something here that you might like to see, Miss Bart. She spoke the name with an unpleasant emphasis. To Lily, the intonation sounded like a threat. You found something belonging to me, she asked, extending her hand. Mrs. Haffin drew back. Well, if it comes to that, I guess it's mine as much as anybody's, she returned. Lily looked at her perplexedly. She was sure now that her visitor's manner conveyed a threat, but there was nothing in her experience to prepare her for the exact significance of the present scene. She felt, however, that it must be ended as promptly as possible. I don't understand. If this parcel is not mine, why have you asked for me? The woman was unabashed. My husband was janitor to the Benedict till the first of the month. Since then, he can't get nothing to do. Lily remained silent, and she continued. It wasn't no fault of our own, neither. The agent had another man he wanted the place for, and we was put out, bag and baggage. I had a long sickness last winter, and an operation ate up while we put by. And it's hard for me and the children, happened being so long out of a job. Then she had come only to ask Miss Bart to find a place for her husband, or more probably to seek the young lady's intervention with Mrs. Peniston. Lily took refuge in the conventional formula. I'm sorry you've been in trouble, she said. Oh, that we have, miss, and it's only just beginning. If only we'd have got another situation, but the agent, he's dead against us. It ain't no fault of ours, neither, but... At this point, Lily's impatience overcame her. If you have anything to say to me, she interposed. The woman's resentment of the rebuff seemed to spur her. Yes, miss, I'm coming to that. She paused, her eyes on Lily, and continued. When we was at the Benedict, I had charge of some of the gentlemen's rooms. Leastways, I swept them out on Saturdays. Some of the gentlemen got the greatest sight of letters I never saw the like of it. Their waste paper baskets would be fairly, brim be fairly brimming, and papers falling over on the floor. Maybe having so many is how they get so careless. Some of them is worse than others. Mr. Lawrence Selden, he was always one of the carefulest. Burnt his letters in winter and tore them in little bits in the summer. But sometimes he'd have so many, he'd just bunch them together the way others did and tear the lot through once, like this. While she spoke, she had loosened the string from the parcel in her hand. And now she drew forth a letter, which she laid on the table between Miss Bart and herself. As she had said, the letter was torn in two, but with a rapid gesture, she laid the torn edges together and smoothed out the page. A wave of indignation swept over Lily. She felt herself in the presence of something vile, as yet but dimly conjectured, the kind of vileness of which people whispered, but which she had never thought of as touching her own life. She drew back with disgust, but her withdrawal was checked by a sudden discovery. 
Under the glare of Mrs. Peniston's chandelier, she had recognized the handwriting. The words, scrawled in heavy ink on pale tinted note paper, smote Lily's ear as though she had heard them spoken. At first, she did not grasp the full import of the situation. She understood only that before her lay a letter written by Bertha Dorset and addressed, presumably, to Lawrence Selden. The packet in Mrs. Hatton's hand doubtless contained more of the same kind. The letter before her was short, but its few words told a long history, a history over which, for the last four years, the friends of the writer had smiled and shrugged, viewing it merely as one among the countless good situations of mundane comedy. Now the other side presented itself. The code of Lily's world decreed that a woman's husband should be the only judge of her conduct. She was technically above suspicion while she had the shelter of his approval, or even of his indifference. But with a man of George Dorset's temper, there could be no thought of condemnation. The possessor of his wife's letters could overthrow with a touch the whole structure of her existence. And into what hands Bertha Dorset's secret had been delivered. For a moment, the irony of the coincidence tinged Lily's disgust with a confused sense of triumph. But the disgust prevailed. All of her instinctive resistance, of taste, of training, of blind inherited scruples, rose against the other feeling. Her strongest sense was one of personal contamination. She moved away. I know nothing of these letters, she said. I have no idea why you brought them here. Mrs. Happen faced her. I'll tell you why, miss. I brought them to you to sell, because I ain't got no other way of raising money. And if we don't pay our rent by tomorrow night, we'll be put out. I've never done anything of the kind before. And if you'd speak to Mr. Selden, or to Mr. Rosedale about getting Happen taken on again, I seen you talking to Mr. Rosedale on the steps the day you came out of Mr. Selden's rooms. The blood rushed to, Jilly, to Lily's forehead. She understood now. Mrs. Happen supposed her to be the writer of the letters. In her anger, she was about to order the woman out, but an impulse restrained her. The mention of Selden's name had started a new train of thought. Bertha Dorset's letters were nothing to her. They might go where chance carried them but Selden was inextricably involved in their fate. Men do not at worst suffer from such exposure. And in this instance, the flash of divination which had carried the meaning of the letters to Lily's brain had revealed also that they were appeals, repeated and therefore probably unanswered, for the renewal of a tie which time had evidently relaxed. Nevertheless, the fact that the correspondence had been allowed to fall into strange hands would convict Selden of negligence in a matter where the world holds the least pardonable. And there were graver risks to consider where a man of Dorset's ticklish balance was concerned. She weighed these things unconsciously. She was aware only of feeling that Selden would wish the letters rescued, and that therefore she must obtain them. Beyond that, her mind did not travel. She had indeed a quick vision of returning the packet to Bertha Dorset, and of the opportunities the restitution offered. But this thought lit up abysses from which she shrank back ashamed. Meanwhile, Mrs. Haffin, prompt to perceive her hesitation, had opened the packet and arranged its contents on the table. All the letters had been pieced together with strips of thin paper. Some were in small fragments, the others merely torn in half. They nearly covered the table. Lily said in a low voice, what do you wish me to pay you? Mrs. Happen's face reddened with satisfaction. It was clear that the young lady was badly frightened. Mrs. Happen made an exorbitant sum. But Miss Park showed herself a less ready prey than might have been expected from her imprudent opening. She refused to pay the price name and, after a hesitation, met it by a counteroffer of half the amount. Mrs. Happen stiffened. Her hand traveled toward the outspread letters, folding them slowly. I guess they're worth more to you than to me, miss. But the poor has got to live as well as the rich, she observed sententiously. <laughs> Lily was throbbing with fear, but the insinuation fortified her resistance. You're mistaken, she said indifferently. I've offered all I'm willing to give for the letters. But there may be other ways of getting them. Mrs. Happen raised a suspicious glance. She had a vision of the machinery of revenge, which a word of this commanding young lady's might set in motion. She applied the corner of the shawl to her eyes and murmured that for her part, she had never been mixed up in such business before. And all she thought of was that the letters mustn't go any farther. 
Lily stood motionless, keeping between herself and the guitar woman the greatest distance compatible with the need of speaking in low tones. The idea of bargaining for the letters was intolerable, but she knew that if she appeared to weaken, Mrs. Halfman would increase her original demand. She could never afterward recall how long the duel lasted, or what was the decisive stroke which put her in possession of the letters. She knew only that the door had finally closed and that she stood alone with the packet in her hand. She had no idea of reading the letters. Even to unfold Mrs. Halfman's dirty newspaper would have seemed degrading. But what did she intend to do with its contents? The recipient of the letters had meant to destroy them. To do so was to lessen whatever merit lay in having secured their possession. But how destroy them so effectually that there should be no second risk of their falling in such hands? In her own room, Lily glanced toward the grate. Here she could burn a few papers without risking, without risk of incurring, incurring her aunt's disapproval. She made no immediate motion to do so, however. Into her mind came a vision of Bertha Dorset, smiling, flattered, victorious, holding her up to ridicule by insinuations intelligible to every member of their little group. The thought of the ridicule struck deeper than any other sensation. Lily knew every turn of the elusive jargon which could flay its victims without the shedding of blood. Her cheek burned, and she rose and caught up the letters. She no longer meant to destroy them. Instead, she approached her desk and tied and sealed the packets. As she did, it struck her with a flash of irony that she was indebted to Gus Trenner for the means of buying them.